Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel Buzzbaits. My name is Tony and this video is one in a series of videos that looks at the science of evolution. Today we are looking at the evolution of the dog, also known by its scientific name Canis familiaris. We will be looking at its relationship with its nearest ancestor, the wolf, known scientifically as Canis lupus, and its evolution from a now extinct wolf creature that lived thousands of years ago. We are going to look at how a wild wolf creature domesticated itself thousands of years ago and eventually benefited from natural selection. There was a time when Besset hounds, corgis and terriers etc did not exist. In fact, there was a time when no dog breeds existed. And yet today we have hundreds of breeds. However, despite this fact, we would always expect a dog to produce another dog. This is a predictable law in evolutionary science. One of the absolute laws of evolutionary biology is that you cannot outgrow your ancestry. Remember this, you cannot outgrow your ancestry. So scientists would expect a dog to produce a dog. And yet there really was a time when no dogs existed. But how can this be possible? Did God not create the dog kinds to simply be dogs? The answer is no. Modern dog breeds are the result of human intervention and not a supernatural magical spell. And this intervention happened at a point in which evolution allowed natural selection to take place within a species of now extinct wolf creatures. So modern dog breeds have an ancestor and that ancestor was a wolf. But how did we get from a wild wolf to a modern little pug dog creature? Well, the process is called microevolution. And in this video, we are going to look at how this process allowed a living organism to change its physical appearance and behavior. How Canis lupus, the wolf, evolved into Canis familiaris, the dog. Yes, that playful little dog has a great, 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 great granddaddy. And that granddaddy happens to be its ancestor. And that ancestor was a wolf. The process that leads to a physical and behavioral change in a living organism is a prediction made in the science of evolution and is certainly observed in wolf dog evolution and it has been tested. Charles Darwin had thought that due to the amazing diversity of the dog that it must have evolved from several canines. However, before Darwin, it was also believed that dogs had always been dogs and were created in that form by God. Despite concessions now made by some young earth creationists, in the biblical understanding, kinds cannot change. A dog must always produce a dog. Change was not even considered possible. In the early 19th century, the general public would never have thought that an evolutionary process had taken place. It would have been viewed as impossible in the early 19th century and viewed as a contradiction to biblical teachings. Imagine a wolf creature could change into a cuddly little pet dog creature. That would have been considered a fairy tale. However, through the study of evolutionary science, that belief has now changed and the process confirmed as a fact. Darwin stated, if it could be shown that the Greyhound, Terrier, Spaniel and the Bulldog, which we all know propagate their own kind truly, were the offspring of any single species, then such facts would have great weight in making us doubt the immutability of the many closely allied natural species. 
This belief by Darwin was confirmed in the 20th century through tests, genetics and observation. We now know that we can doubt immutability and that change is possible and that evolutionary change occurs. And dogs are an excellent example of how changes to physical traits in a living organism can be traced back thousands of years and how environmental stresses natural selection, a change in allele frequencies, genetic mutations and time can contribute to this evolutionary process. I would now like to look at a study by Dr. Amanda Pendleton and Dr. Jeffrey Kidd, who have utilized new genomics technology to address the issue of how wolves genetically evolved into dogs. They wanted to look at the genetic process that led to the emergence of the trait that most distinguishes wolves from dogs, their behaviour, and how the genes that impacted on behaviour then impacted on physical changes. So, that said, let us look at something significant in our understanding of cells and genes in relation to the evolution of the wolf into dog something which has been studied in vertebrate evolution, neural crest cells. Neural crest cells are a temporary group of cells unique to vertebrates that arise from the embryonic ectoderm germ layer. Neural crest cells are a multipotent stem cell population. They contribute to other cells during embryonic development. So, they are a group of embryonic cells that are pinched off during the formation of the neural tube. The neural tube is the precursor of the spinal cord. Remember, they are temporary. They contribute to other cells during the embryonic stage and they migrate. They contribute and they migrate. Therefore, it is a stem cell population that migrates. Many of the morphological, physiological and behavioural novelties of vertebrates are derived from neural crest cells. They play a major role in defining forms and functions of multiple tissues such as the skull, face, ears, pigmentation of fur. They also contribute to the development of the brain nervous system and adrenal system, all of which can influence behavior. Remember, neural crest cells form in the dorsal. They then detach. They then migrate throughout the embryo. This gives rise to a diverse array of cell types that go on to make up many of the morphological and physiological traits that characterize the vertebrate clade. Changes in the number or activity of neural crest cells in any of the final body locations can subsequently alter the size, shape or level of expression of the corresponding trait. The level of expression, including behaviour. Remember, neural crest cells play a major role in defining the final forms and functions of multiple tissues in all animals with backbones, including most of the skull, face, and even pigmentation of skin and fur. Look at the different physical characteristics of the two dogs on this illustration. These differences were already determined during the embryonic stage. Much of what makes a dog look and behave the way they do is determined during their early development as an embryo. By the time dog puppies are born, their appearance is already different than wolf puppies. The studies by Dr. Pendleton and Dr. Kidd support the evidence that neural crest cells can influence behavior and it was the change in behavior of the now extinct wolf ancestor to modern domestic dogs that allowed a beneficial relationship to develop. These gene differences reflect the outcomes of complex and intricate processes during the embryonic development as cells are being established and involve the movement 
and coordination of many cells, as demonstrated in the slide looking at neural crest cells. Changes in the number or activity of neural crest cells in any of the funnel locations they migrate to can subsequently alter the size, shape or level of expression of the corresponding crest. Now that we have a basic understanding of neural crest cells in respect of dogs, let us look further at the work of Dr. Amanda Pendleton and Dr. Jeffrey Kidd. As previously stated, they utilized new genomics technology to address the question of the behavioral change of wolves that allowed domestication and eventual evolution. The change in behavior was its first evolutionary step to becoming a dog. And this change in behavior was the result of environmental pressure on neural crest cells that allowed natural selection to ensure the wolves with the tame genes survived. Therefore, natural selection and survival of the fittest. But how do these tame cells affect phenotype traits? And what is the evidence? Dr. Pendleton and Dr. Kidd have compared the genetic diversity of village dogs, which are semi-feral, survive mostly on human trash, but are domesticated. These dogs are close to dogs which were domesticated 40,000 years ago. As most modern dog breeds arose within the last 300 years, it was important to select a dog that had little interaction with human-induced selection. Therefore, research was conducted on semi-feral village dogs, which are the most genetically diverse and have undergone limited targeted selection by humans since initial domestication. Since the domestication of wolves thousands of years ago, dogs have slowly lost genetic diversity, but village dogs maintain much more genetic diversity and therefore are closer to their wolf ancestor. In their study, Pendleton and Kidd compared the diversity of the village dog to the wolves and identified 246 regions of the genome which had been altered during domestication. By using village dogs, which have not had a recent loss of diversity due to human-directed inbreeding, scientists were able to find old events shared among living dogs and the ancient samples from the Neolithic, suggesting that scientists identified changes associated with the domestication process. These changes were found near genes that perform critical functions in the developing dog, including many genes that are associated with the neural crest, nervous system function, and circadian rhythms. This study illustrates and supports the evidence that neural crest cells play a major role in defining the forms and functions of multiple tissues in all animals with backbones, including most of the skull, face, and even the pigmentation of the skin and fur. In respect of wolf evolution to dog, they noted environmental pressure to acquire food sources may have led to initial self-domestication and the development of tame cells in the neural crest. In addition to changing the outward appearance, these tame cells ultimately contributed to the development of the brain, nervous system and adrenal systems, all of which can influence behavior. And the behavior of a wild wolf is very different to the behavior of a domesticated poodle. And it was this evolutionary behavioral change that eventually led to physical changes we can observe today. Thousands of years ago, genes within wolves involved in the neural crest pathway began a slow change in frequency due to self-domestication. This period of self-domestication is linked to natural selection. This was the period in which wolves would scavenge food from human settlements. 
As time passed, this led to a wide range of different appearances relative to wild wolves and leaving signatures in the dog genome. However, those wolves that were tamer and less aggressive increased their contact with humans. As time passed, the wolves who partook in this behaviour became more comfortable in scavenging near humans and therefore with increasing contact with humans became less aggressive. The gene pool with the tame gene multiplied. Their relationship with humans became an evolutionary advantage to their survival. Those wolves that adapted this behaviour caused a change in that particular gene pool. Those wolves that were aggressive would be forced away by humans and would have to continue to hunt for their food. They would be banned to the harsh world that they then lived in. These wolves and their gene pool eventually became extinct. Although there is no human alive today that observed the ancient transition of wolf to dog, and although we do not possess the transitional fossil that shows this change, we have completed tests in crossbreeding wolves with dogs to demonstrate how these changes did occur. In 1969, the West German zoologist Eric Zeim crossbred wolves with poodles. As each generation gave birth to a new generation, we could observe how the alleles were being inherited and the transitional forms between wolf and dog developed. We observed gradual physical and behavioural changes over time. And this was before genetic confirmation in the 21st century. This was microevolution at work. And the only difference between microevolution and macroevolution is time. A young Earth creationist by the name of Kent Hovind accepts microevolution. Well, the evidence is overwhelming. But he will not accept macroevolution as he denies the universe is billions of years of age. He believes the entire universe is only 6,000 years old. But at least we have made a start with his acceptance of microevolution. Now, I want you to remember the name Kent Hovind and Hovindism. This is something and someone I will be dealing with in other videos. Once the relationship between wolves and humans had been established, the process of natural selection, which had allowed the relationship to be established due to a behavioural change in wolves, was replaced with artificial selection as humans began to breed wolves for various functions. But remember, the process started with environmental stresses on acquiring food that led to a better survival rate for those wolves who self-domesticated. The evolutionary process in genes expressing certain traits which were of advantage to wolves in their environmental coexistence with humans continued. But now it became a much faster process. This is more akin to evolution on steroids. Natural selection led to artificial selection. And as such, we are now able to observe the result of these changes. As their numbers increased, they would pass on the trait of tameness in their genes to their offspring, and this increased that particular gene pool and allele frequency. This allowed a codependent and beneficial relationship with humans to develop. This ancestral gene pool survived and has been passed on to the dog breeds we observe today. Since then, there have been additional mutations to genes that has created new information within their genetic code and therefore variety in functions. Those genes that gave an advantage to the relationship with humans and contributed to those particular wolves' survival as a cooperative species with humans were passed on in an hereditary process that eventually led to the evolution of the wolf into what we recognise as a domesticated dog. It was not one individual wolf that allowed this to happen. It was a population. 
evolution works with population change and not one individual change. And those wolves with those passive genes survived, became companions to humans and began the evolutionary change of physical characteristics. However, that original population of wolves that is ancestor to modern dogs and modern grey wolves has now gone extinct. The wild, more aggressive species ceased to exist. They did not survive, but their tame aversion benefited in its relationship with humans. Its survival is evident in the genes it has passed on. Its genes are still evident in the modern domestic dog and the modern grey wolf, both of who share a bond with their ancestor. But what else has affected the evolution of a wolves to dogs and continues to affect this evolution? Well, it is a fact that gene duplication occurs. How does it occur? Well, it occurs through several mechanisms, including during DNA replication when errors can occur and a new duplicated gene is formed. Duplication provides new genetic material for mutations. Look at this illustration that shows an extension of genetic material due to duplication. As you can see, there is an extension. After duplication, the copy of the original gene is often free from selective pressure. This means mutations have no deleterious effects to its host organism. The host organism can continue to function normally, which means dogs can continue to produce dogs. However, other changes can now occur within that species due to duplication, due to mutations occurring to the duplicated gene. At first glance, you might be tempted to think that the dachshund's short legs are simply a disability. To the contrary, the unique shape of this dog's legs make it a surprisingly powerful digger, and most importantly, allow it to enter small burrows to coax out rabbits, groundhogs, and even badgers from their dens. Other dogs can only dream of such adventures. By looking at the dachshund's DNA, researchers have found that their unique legs are the result of a duplication event. A gene called FGF4 was copied and inserted elsewhere in their DNA. The new gene happens to produce protein in a way that interacts with their growing bones, reshaping the dog's legs and opening up an entirely new hunting niche for the animal. Humans who liked the trait bred the original dog with many others, eventually giving rise to several new dog breeds and proving that sometimes, even the strangest of mutations within the right environment, can turn out to be extremely beneficial. The duplication is now free to take on mutations. These mutations can lead to new traits and functions. For example, various types of keratin in the human body are the result of duplications of a single gene. And I'm going to use keratin as an example of mutations due to gene duplication. Hair and nails are comprised of a protein called keratin. The various types of keratin in the body are the result of duplications of a single gene. This duplicated gene was a source of mutations. Over time, as species diversified, new genes for keratin with different functions arose in different species as illustrated in this slide. Keratin is found in nails, horns, feathers, skin, wool, and hair. This illustration shows examples of mutations in a duplicated gene and how it can vary among the vertebrates. In respect of how genes affect the process of evolution within a living organism, I would like to highlight a gene mutation example most domestic dogs and grey wolves have short fur. 
through the science of genetics, scientists have discovered that a single point mutation on a gene called FGF5 simply changed a G to a T in the genetic code and is responsible for long fur found in some dogs such as the Shih Tzu. I will look further at point mutations in another video looking at evolution. For now, please simply note from this slide the result of this process. As we can see in the evolution of the dog from the wolf and its enormous diversity, there have been changes in gene frequency. There have been duplications of genes. This led to new genetic material. There have been mutations to these duplicated genes. We see how all this has led to changes in physical appearance and behavioural traits. For example, looking at this image, which animal would you be more comfortable in giving a hug to? Based on your predictions of their behaviour. Dogs will produce dogs, and as such, we cannot outgrow our ancestry. Through genetics, that wolf is related to that little white dog and they both share an ancestor. It was small changes that resulted in microevolution. And it is the accumulation of these small changes over time that leads to macroevolution. The ancestor of the dog, the now extinct wild wolf, also had an ancestor. And that ancestor had an ancestor and so on and so forth. You now know that the modern domesticated dog and the modern wolf share an ancestor which is extinct. This video has been about dog evolution, about the evolution from the wolf, but also it's been about relatedness and ancestry and this has been proved via genetic study, predictions and observations. Evolutionary science is not a religion. It really is a science. Carl Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist from the 18th century whose work in taxonomy provides huge support to the science of evolution in that it allows us to identify, name and classify organisms. It provides evidence for ancestry and relatedness. So let us look in a little more detail at this classification system and the ancestry and relatedness in respect of the dog. The dog is a subspecies of the species Canis lupus. The dog has evolved from the wolf. So, the dog and the wolf are part of the genus Canis. This genus also includes jackals. Therefore, jackals are also part of dog ancestry. There is relatedness between the dog and the jackal. Let us now look at the family that they belong to. Canidae. This family also includes foxes and dingoes. All are canines. Relatedness and ancestry is still established. We then come to the order that all these are part of. The order of carnivora. This entire family belongs to an order which means meat eaters. Within this order, there are two subclades, those that are dog-like meat eaters and those that are cat-like meat eaters. This order includes bears, raccoons, weasels and lions. In fact, 270 species and as you can see, all form part of the dog ancestry and relatedness. The dog has still not outgrown its ancestry. We then 
place them into their class. Would you agree that dogs are mammals? Would you agree that apes are mammals? Why? Because, like humans, who are also mammals, we share ancestral characteristics, such as being warm-blooded and higher vertebrates. Other mammals include bats, horses and whales. Yes, a whale is not a fish, it's a mammal. We then come to the part of the ancestry that looks at subphylum. This is all about being a vertebrate. Would you agree that a dog is a vertebrate? Why? Because vertebrates are those living organisms that share a segmented spinal column. We therefore now expand that ancestry and relatedness to jawless fish, birds and reptiles. Would you agree that these are all vertebrates? Yes. Next is phylum, chordata. This is where living organisms share a notochord, dorsal nerve cords, funigal slits and post anal tail. And yes, dogs fall into this category. And they are still remaining faithful to their relatedness to other species who share these traits and to their ancestry. And finally, would you agree that all dogs are part of the kingdom of Animalia? Yes, dogs are animals. Therefore, they have a relationship with other animals. And therefore, like humans who are also animals, they do not evolve from pine trees. This is a Hovind Strawman argument. But what is it that finally connects all the animals together that cements their relatedness? The eukaryotic cell. All living organisms that are plant or animal based are eukaryotic cells. Therefore, as stated and as proved, dogs cannot outgrow their ancestry and that ancestry goes all the way back to the eukaryotic cell. All animals are eukaryotic. Therefore, a eukaryotic cellular living organism, such as a dog, will always give birth to a eukaryotic cellular living organism, even if its physical appearance may change through the process of evolution which deals with population change in traits over time. We know that the dog, in all its forms, did not always look like a dog. The little pug once looked like a wolf. And we therefore can predict that the wolf did not always look like a wolf. As we now know, the modern domesticated dog has an ancestor. That ancestor was a now extinct wild wolf. I would like to give a brief overview of how the wolf evolved. This is to extend the evidence for relatedness and ancestry in dogs. Fossils of populations help us to recognize the evolution of the wolf. Yes, fossils. It does not matter if it's an individual fossil, as we know that fossil would have been part of a population. Another hovenism is to say that we cannot prove one individual fossil ever gave birth. It doesn't matter. We are dealing with the population that fossil belongs to. Fossils of populations are dated using modern dating methods. I will explain the methods and accuracy of dating in another video. Right now, I would like to establish the fact that wolves are carnivores. That is a fact. 
Then what was the ancestor of the carnivores that led to the wolf? What is the line of descent? The current fossil record has identified it as maces, and we know from the fossil record of its remains and modern dating methods that this genus goes back 66 million years. evolved from previous ancestors, as demonstrated in the previous slide, and used the same biological process of small changes over time as studied in microevolution. Please note, as you look at this picture, how different the extinct dire wolf is to our modern grey wolf. There are differences and these differences can be explained by looking at how change occurs in the gene pool. And in this video, we have looked at how change occurs, and it does not involve magic. Can you see the difference between the extinct dire wolf and the modern grey wolf? So, let us now summarise the evidence contained within this video for the evolution of the dog from an extinct wolf, looking at the fossil record, genetics, zoological experiments, observations, and of course, those neural crest cell studies. Although there are fossil remains of wolves from 40,000 years ago and beyond, there are no fossil remains of dogs prior to this period. Therefore, dogs as we recognise them today did not exist 40,000 years ago. Genetics show a 99.9% .9 similarity between dogs and wolves. Therefore, Although DNA similarity between a Chihuahua and a modern grey wolf is confirmed, it is obvious that evolution has provided physical and behavioural differences. The genetic evidence also proves that modern domesticated dogs and modern grey wolves share a common ancestor. Genetics within evolutionary science allows us to observe gene duplication effects. For example, Mutations occurring on a duplicated gene which allows an extension of genetic material can provide diversity in the application of keratin. We have observed the results of single point mutations in dogs which means a change in the genetic code which can provide a new trait such as short legs which have given some dogs an advantage when hunting in rabbit holes for food. Zoologists such as Eric Zeim have completed scientific experiments in crossbreeding wolves with poodles and we've been able over time to observe the phenotype and behavioural changes of this particular living organism. Scientific studies by scientists such as Dr Amanda Pendleton and Dr Jeffrey Kidd support studies into vertebrate evolution of the influence of neural crest cells on physical and behavioural changes of a wolf into a dog. These studies identified 246 regions of the genome which were altered during domestication. 
an increase in tamer behavioral genes within a now extinct wolf population allowed self-domestication. Self-domestication promoted natural selection. Natural selection meant that wolves who increased this gene pool passed on the trait to their offspring descendants, whilst the wolves who did not have the genetic advantage ceased to exist. So how might creationists challenge the evidence within this video? Well, let's look at point number one. Creationists might say this simply proves variation within a species. Well, yes, it does. But it also proves how that variation can occur through environmental pressure, the influence of neural crest cells on other cells and cell migration, changes in allele frequency, gene duplication and accumulations of mutations. These provide the mechanism for this variation. And this mechanism is what also supports and drives evolution. Let's look at point number two. Creationists might say, dogs still produce dogs and not cats. Yes, and this is what evolution would predict. However, it also proves that over time, a wild, dangerous, carnivorous wolf creature produced a little domesticated pug dog creature. How about point number three? Microevolution does not prove macroevolution. Well, macroevolution requires microevolution to be its precursor. And microevolution has been proved in the evolution of the dog. As macroevolution employs the same process mechanisms as microevolution, all we have to do in most instances is add time. Point number four. The variety in dogs is proof of how quickly species diversified after the flood. Well, actually, after self-domestication through natural selection, dog diversification became the result of human-induced artificial selection. One last uh, final question for creationists such as Kent Hovind. Will a wolf always produce a wolf? Kent Hovind and creationists such as he state that dogs will always produce dogs. Well, I think the answer to that question has already been answered in the science of evolutionary biology. Looking at Canis lupus, the wild extinct wolf creature to our modern domesticated pet dog, I think we can say that um, a wolf didn't always produce just a wolf. My name is Tony B and I hope you will agree that what has been provided in this video is science-based evidence that has included genetic studies, predictions and observations and not a religious belief based on faith. So I would like to thank you for watching this Buzzbait presentation and I look forward to your feedback. Once again, thank you very much for watching.